The Schweiker House was built in 1938 by noted architect Paul Schweiker and still stands in its original Schomburg location. With you now to talk about this important piece of Schomburg architecture are the executive director of the Schweiker House Preservation Trust, Todd Wenger, current and longtime resident of the house, Martil Langsdorf, and president of the Schweiker House Preservation Trust Board, John Latko. Well, welcome to Speaking of Schomburg. Thanks for having us. Todd, Todd tell me about your, your role in, in, in preserving the Schweiker House. Well, the village acquired the property from uh, the Metropolitan Reclamation District in 2001, and the village um, stepped in to preserve the house uh, because it was uh, being condemned by them. And since then, the village has worked to not only preserve the house, but enhance it. And ongoing preservation of the house requires that there be a third party involved to oversee the preservation uh, for future generations. So my role in this is to uh, set up the nonprofit organization, the Schweiker House Preservation Trust, and to act as its executive director. Where's the house located? It's in the far southeast corner of Schaumburg on Meacham Road. Okay. Martil, you still live there, don't you? Yes, I do. Well, how did you acquire the house? What, did, what, what, what got you to buy the Schweiker House? Well, after house? looking at 100 houses, I was so upset by the dearth of houses that didn't suit us. We thought of building, we thought of everything, and looked at every, every suburb that was in the radius of the Argonne National Lab where my husband was a senior physicist. Well, it turned out I was going to go to Europe and stay there. I was so upset with, with, with the lack of, since I'm an artist, I needed a studio and things like that. So. It turned out through a curator at the Art Institute, best friend of Paul Schweiker, was also a close friend of ours. And when I told about the plight of not finding housing, we used to live by the University of Chicago, but it made sense to live out west. They saw Paul Schweiker on the way in from an Aspen conference, and Paul decided to right then and there to be director of the Yale School of Architecture and dissolve his partnership. Since he built the house for himself, and on the way in, the, uh, Myrick Rogers and his wife said, that's the house for the Langsdorfs. And I remember telling my husband about this, and he said, it's too far away. And, and I said, well, it hurt to look. Then <laughs> the rest is history. Get him in the door, right? <laughs> now, you're an artist yourself. I mean, it's, it's yeah. kind of a, you're an artist living in an architectural masterpiece. Well, I inherited the studio in which he did all his architectural triumphs, which is perfect for me, built in flat files and everything. And um, it just, it, it's a work of art. And somehow we recognized it intuitively, I guess. But it was in the middle of nowhere to most people that live in a city. Urban people thought we were out of our minds to go in a place before there was a Schomburg. <laughs> John, tell me about your role in, in the preservation of, of, the, of the Schweiker House. Well, I was asked to be on the uh, board of directors, and we recently had our first meeting, which officers were appointed or elected. And uh, I did wind up uh, being elected as the president of the board. So my role right now is to help, um, help the board get this thing off the ground. <laughs> and what's your background? My background is I've been an art teacher in Schaumburg for 35 years, and I've been on the Cultural Commission for 24 years, and a uh, member of the 1% for our, uh, Art uh, Committee uh, that the village has. And uh, at one point, they were overseeing the Schweiker House, so I think that's how, my, how, uh, that's how I wound up getting introduced to the house and uh, you know, learning about it. Now, you, you, were, uh, you were friends of the Atchers, weren't you? Yes. Our closest neighbor had the 10 acres to the north, and we were best friends until Bob moved away and died. Well, Ma Maggie's, Maggie's still around, though. I, I, she is. I, I, I talked to her not that long ago. So do I. We keep in touch, even with the offspring. Now we have we have the uh, a Prairie Center for the Arts. Uh, where did that name come from? I think I made it up. <laughs> That's true, you did. Because it was a prairie. I mean, 
yes. had a prairie where, around the Schweiker house, and it seemed everything was a prairie. And there was, when Bob was, was um, mayor of the village, he was keen on establishing an art commission, and he was very art-oriented. And he loved the house. All the Atchers did, still do. And um, Now you had another, another triumph, I think, in, in, in that you designed the doomsday clock, didn't you, for the year? Uh... Oh, yes. <laughs> I'll probably go down in history for that one. Well, well, tell but us it's about that. The, wor the world over. I mean, how else am I going to get on the front page of the, daily, of the Dallas Daily News? <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess, I guess there are a number of ways you probably could, but I'm, I'm certainly... <laughs> so, how I, did it come about? Well, yeah. the, the number of physicists after World War II wanted to um, protest the dropping of the atomic bomb. And they um, had, a, had a petition that I think was never read by Harry Truman, but anyway, there was this group that thought it was too barbaric. And, and then there were those that formed a communication, was in those days called a mimeograph <laughs> letter and, and, and pamphlet. And they wanted to put it into magazine form because there were so many people that were interested. Well, it in certainly this. captured the imagination of people and certainly struck home the need for, for being aware of, of nuclear disarmament. Well, because it, it was, considered so crucial and so dangerous, and it still is after all these years. But back to the Schweiker house. We have some, we have some pictures here. We have a clip. Martel? That's the uh, drafting part of it, half of it, of the drafting room where Paul Schweiker did all of his work and where I do my work. This is the uh, extension added, cantilevered out of the uh, studio wing which was added in 1947. And this is uh, the beginning of the entrance at the far left with this wonderful walk up, which is very, the entrance, which is very Oriental, very Japanese, which influenced Schweiker in this house. All my Japanese friends say it's more Japanese than they could believe. Uh, it's once influenced. Again, once again, the cantilever. And that's the, uh, it's now a spare, Spare bedroom. It's a guest wing. Ah, okay, all right. Now, now, where where was Paul Schweiger in the pantheon of, of uh, architects? What, what would he, he rank? He, well, he's called a master architect. He would rank quite high in the in the uh, field of architecture. He's not a universal name like Frank Lloyd Wright or Mies van der Rohe, but. He was close friends with them, and they visited the house many times. Now, there's a landscaping element to the Schweiker House Preservation, too, isn't there? Yes. It was designed by Franz Lipp, who's very well, famous. Now, he is famous about gardens, and he had an exhibition at the Art Institute last year. However, the Schweiker House gardens were not in that because he never made a drawing. He was a friend of Schweiker. There were no drawings of what he designed. So... Uh, but it's still known as that, and we've kept the design. We've stuck in a few alien what kind of bedding plant, What kind of bedding plants do you have there, Martel? Well, there's a famous, uh, started by Schweiker, um, peony garden, which has now about 25 different varieties. Okay. And um, it's famous for that. Also, the way he lined it, it I was told it was a cornfield at one time. And so everything there has been planted. Now, if you could name something, why is the Schweiker House so significant and why is it important to preserve it? And I'll start with John. Um, Schweiker was a contemporary of Frank Lloyd Wright. And uh, he was, uh, so his architecture was, is um, kind of a, I think it's, I see it as a, a threshold to modernism. He, he has elements of prairie school in it. He has an international uh, style elements and obviously Japanese elements. He was in Japan and was influenced by that. So he kind of synthesized all those things in a unique way for the 1930s. And he was, um, he was known then as an, as an avant-garde uh, architect. Uh, and in fact, uh, I think he, rather than Frank Lloyd Wright, was included in the um, Museum of Modern Arts Architecture uh, show that year, 1933. Sure. And, uh, and uh, Philip Johnson, I think, uh, he didn't want Frank Lloyd Wright, <laughs> but he wanted Paul Schweiker. So he was included there. So he really was uh, um, an innovator, 
and he was at the beginning of what we call modernist um, architecture now, and he was very influential. And That's architects right. that throughout history have been influenced by his work. Todd? Uh, I'd agree. I think uh, another reason is that he wasn't as prolific, say, as Frank Lloyd Wright or some of the other notable architects throughout history, but his pieces, you know, um, are enduring and they survive through time. And we have one of the, you know, one of his best. Well, Todd? Thank you for having us. Martil. It was a pleasure. It's always a pleasure talking with you. Thank you. John, thank you for being here. Thanks for having us, Al. It's an ultra-modern hotel, a gathering place for top-notch events, and an exquisite, exquisite work of art. We'll talk about it next on Speaking of Schaumburg.